I want to welcome you. I want to welcome all of our campuses. I want to welcome you if you're watching online, wherever you are. And uh, I got to tell you, our, our goal as a church, uh, we have a mission, and uh, it's to help people discover who Jesus is. And then once you discover who Jesus is, to grow up and become the person that he uh, designed you to be. And so everything we do is kind of geared towards that and what we talk about and how we talk about it. So we're going to continue today in a series that we started about a month ago. Um, we're calling it The Battle Within um, because it's a, about our mental health. And uh, it's the battle within because that's where the battle takes place. It takes place in our minds. And uh, it's a battle that all of us at some point or another are engaged in. And so uh, I think one of the things that we're trying to bring to the subject is a sense of no taboo. Um, it's perfectly okay to talk about this in church. It's perfectly okay to talk about it personally and uh, just be able to say, you know what, here, here's, a, here's an issue that I'm struggling with. One of the reasons why it is okay um, to not be okay is because none of the rest of us are okay. We pretend to be okay and we come to church and act like everything's okay. Um, when the truth of the matter is, and I've said this as strong as I know how, I know this from years of being a pastor, everybody has a struggle with something. I've referred to it as your it. Everybody has an it. Your it might not be my it, and my it might not be your it, but everybody's got an it, and uh, it can overwhelm us at times, and it can get the best of us. And if I told you that I was struggling with some sort of like a physical thing, like, I, I, you know, hey guys, today I, I feel sick, I feel like I have the flu, so please bear with me, you would bear with me. If I told you, you know, spiritually, hey, I'm just kind of, I feel like I'm under attack today, so please bear with me, you'd bear with me. If emotionally I said, you know, I'm just really upset um, because I heard some things about, you know, my family, you'd, you'd go, oh man. Well, uh, but when we talk about anything mental, all of a sudden it's like, oh, oh, oh. But the truth is everybody has mental health and everybody here has physical health. If you're alive, you have physical health. There is, there, when you're dead, you don't. But if you're alive, you might be poor, but you have it. And everybody has mental health, and so it's perfectly okay to be here. Now, what I want to do is I want to kind of turn this conversation. I want to point something out that we have not yet pointed out, and that is this, that I want to explain to you that mental health issues um, tend to run together. Uh, I would say it this way. They, they're, they're a gang, okay? They gang up on you. They're, uh, they're a pack. They're like a pack. They're a herd. They... They don't just show up randomly in, in isolation. They, they run together. And this is important to understand because it's usually never one issue that we're ever struggling with. It's a combination of certain issues in a certain manner that just seem to get the best of us. Let me, let me try to explain this. And, and I, I am not saying this always happens this way. Please understand that. But I am going to try to show you how a progression can happen. Um, and, and again, these are not I'm going to put them in a certain order just to make a point to illustrate it. But this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. See, you, you might one day wake up and you find yourself you're afraid of something. So you got fear on your mind. And, and this fear of whatever this is, is kind of consuming you. And before long, you start feeling anxious about it. And, and so you're feeling anxious and all of a sudden you're not really thinking about the fear. You're thinking about the anxiety. And then the anxiety begins to stress you out. And so you're starting to feel like I feel a bit overwhelmed with this stress. And, 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 and then you start, once you start feeling overwhelmed, uh, man, right around the corner is burnout where you just feel like I've just had too much. I, I, I can't take any more. And, and so when you start feeling burnout, you might be like, I got to find some way to cope. And so you're coping. And then what could happen is you could actually begin coping with something that becomes harmful, which is not uncommon. And uh, then you find yourself using something uh, unhealthy and then you find yourself addicted to something unhealthy. And you go, how in the world did I get here? Addictions can lead to despair. Despair can lead to depression. Depression can lead to suicide. Now, I am not saying that it's a wheel that once you get on it, you can't get off. What I am trying to say is all of these things tend to relate to each other. You don't need to be addicted to experience depression. You can get there different ways. But they, they always seem to, they run in some sort of a herd, a pack, a gang, and they jump on you and you get overwhelmed. And that's the point I want to make. Because of this, uh, the nature of this, this is why we can't talk about all of it in one talk. It's too much. It's too complicated. So what we've tried to do is, is we've taken each of these weeks and we've tried to isolate an issue. 
and kind of like pull it aside and set it over here and say, let's just look at that thing today. That's all we're going to look at. But you don't do that in isolation as if only that exists. It's in addition to other things, some of which we've already talked about, some of which we will talk about uh, in, you know, in the days to come. And so the problem is, is that so many of us, we don't really want to talk about it because we don't want to think about it. And the problem with that is it's like the check engine light in your car coming on. Whenever the check engine light comes on, the problem is not the check engine light. Can I get an amen from anybody who understands what I just said? It's not the check, it's, it's working. It came on and it's telling you there's a problem. It is not the problem. There's a problem under the hood, under the car somewhere, there's a problem. It is telling you address the problem, but when it comes to mental health, most of us are so wigged out about it. We go, I just don't wanna to talk to anyone. And so we suffer alone, we suffer in silence, and then our family suffers. And so the problem just gets bigger and bigger. So we wanna fix this by getting to the source of it, talking about it, putting it out on the table and going, it's okay to talk about. And so our thing has been, it's okay to not be okay. You don't need to pretend to be what you're not when you come to church. When you come here, don't bother to pretend, don't bother to you know, act like everything's fine. It just come and just be who you are. Now, I would say this, it's okay not to be okay, but we don't want you to stay uh, uh, un okay. Uh, for long because there's help and we can talk about that. So that's what this series is. We're having fun. Next week, by the way, we have a special guest. His name is Ben Foote. He's going to talk about depression. And then again, something that often goes with depression is suicide. So we're going to deal with that next week. Don't miss next week. It's going to be fantastic. But let's let's get to what I want to talk about today with you. We're gonna take two subjects uh, out of this, you know, this whole batch of issues, this gang. We're gonna isolate two characters and we're gonna just talk about them. We're gonna talk about stress and we're gonna talk about burnout. They tend to go together, all right? Not always, but they tend to go together. So we're gonna isolate these two. And I'm gonna ask your permission, uh, which every now and then I, I ask this, please understand that I don't wanna just jump into the Bible. And not because I don't think it's relevant. I want, to I want to talk about the subject. I want to talk about stress and burnout. And then I want to show you what the Bible says about stress and burnout. Not just jump in and talk about, well, the Bible says this about, because I don't think we'll be prepared. So let me just talk about stress and burnout. And then trust me, we will get into the Bible, but we'll do that towards the tail end of this. So to get ready for that, open your Bible to uh, Exodus chapter uh, 18. Okay, there's the second book of the Old Testament, just the very beginning of your Bible. And just kind of hold that and we'll, and we'll get to it in just a bit. Okay, so what is stress? What is stress? Let me give you a definition of stress that we might be able to work from. Stress is a natural and generally healthy emotional response to challenging or demanding situations. I'm gonna say it again. Stress is a natural and generally healthy emotional response to challenging or demanding situations. All of us Every last one of us, you, me, every one of us, every one of you, every one of you, all of us experience stress at one time or another, whether you want to or not. All of us experience, let me stress that again. All of us experience stress. There is nobody here, there or there who goes, I, I, why did I come to church today? This does not apply to me. It applies to absolutely all of us, okay? Stress occurs when we feel or perceive some sort of threat, some sort of something that is like gonna take something from us. It, it can often come in the form of a challenge of some sort or another. But what happens is, is when you feel stress, your body then does some stuff. It releases cortisol, it releases adrenaline, and you get kicked up into this mode of fight or flight, and there's more to that, but just, just use those two. Uh, am I gonna fight or am I gonna flee? Am I gonna go at it or am I gonna go away from it? I believe with all my heart that the fight or flight response is a gift from God to prepare you for how you're going to deal with whatever the stress thing is that's coming at you. And um, I, want to, I want to read something that I, I, my friend Jerry Harris, who is a pastor, he wrote this and I just love the way he wrote it. And I'm just going to read what he wrote. Uh, he said that stress might be triggered by illness, injury, parenting, infertility, bereavement, abuse, marriage, divorce, relationships, or caregiving. You might have lost your job, be unemployed long-term, retiring, feeling the pressure of deadlines, exams, work strife, or a new job. You might be moving, dealing with difficult neighbors, worrying about money, or drowning in debt. Did we hit it? 
I mean, out of all of that, surely you're going, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. My guess is it's more than one. You're going, yeah, uh, yeah, I'll take the, that one and that one and that one. Everyone experiences stress. You're normal. It's the, it's the way of life. Now, I want to say this. You might go, okay, well, you hit it, but man, those are some big issues, you know, a divorce, I mean, those are big issues. I, I want to just point out, it doesn't take a big issue to stress us out. In, in fact, people who study this have come up with a list, uh, which again, I'm shortening by far, of the little things that can stress us out. You can get stressed out, you know, just um, getting stuck in traffic. Can I get an amen? You're like, why are you so upset? Because, and then, you know, this idiot, and off you go. And you're overwhelmed. How many of you ever stress out because you spilled something on yourself? Yeah, thank you. And you get there and you go, oh my God, what is that? It's toothpaste all over my black shirt. And, you know, or, or your makeup or whatever it is. You, you, you spilled your coffee on the way and you, you, know, you go to work. And, you know, it feels so... The littlest things can set us off. Uh, waking up late for work. Everybody's done that. And you're racing and you're just uh, you know, feeling the pressure. Uh, struggling to find a parking place. It stress you out in, in, a, you know, in a place where the parking's tight. Sending a text message to the wrong person. Everyone has done that. And all of a sudden you got really intimate when you thought you were talking to your wife or your husband and some guy on the other end goes, I didn't know. You know, thanks, thanks for that. Uh, checking your bank balance, having less money than you expected, that'll stress you out. You, you're going somewhere, it's important, and you, you, you already planned what you're going to wear, and then you discover it's in the wash. That'll stress you out. Uh, you, you have to send an email, so you send an email, it's really important that you do this on time, and you did, and then you discover it was stuck in your drafts file. And uh, you just go, it doesn't take a big thing. We are prone to stress, and that's what I want you to understand. Now, I do want to point out just a couple of things. There's different kinds of stress. There's what's called acute stress and chronic stress. Important to understand, acute stress is short-lived but intense. It's when you get a call and you say, hey, um, don't, I, I don't want to panic you, but your, your son has been in an accident. Or you get word that you know, someone's in, uh, in the hospital or somebody's health is failing. There's a family emergency. Any of that's acute. It's intense, but short-lived. And all of a sudden, it's just your just. And then there's chronic, which is the opposite. It's, it's when you're stressed out. It's not intense, but it's uh, prolonged. You, f you, know, you find out your, your mom's apparently suffering from dementia. You find out you, you know, your father, you know, whatever. You get the idea. And it goes a long time. It's, it's stressful. And here's what I need you to understand, whether it's acute or it is a chronic, um, your body's going to react. And in fact, here's just a couple of ways. And again, I'm making this very simple. Physically, you're possibly going to get headaches. You're going to feel fatigue. You're going to feel muscle tension. All of that is physical. You're going to go through some emotional. Uh, you're going to feel anxiety and maybe irritability. Cognitively, meaning your thinking ability is going to be skewed. You're going to get in a fog. Uh, you're going to have a hard time processing. You're going to find yourself thinking negative thoughts. All of that can affect. Behaviorally, you can do things. You can uh, overeat. You can cope any way uh, inappropriately. You can shirk responsibility. But here's the point. Here's the point. Here's the point. It is normal to feel stress. So don't stress out over feeling stress. It's normal. Now, I'm going to explain something that most of us probably never really think much about. And uh, this is really, really important to understand what I think God's word has to say about the subject. So this is, I'm going to take you down a road that most of us never really walk down. I'm going to explain to you two types of stress, not acute and chronic. Those are time oriented. I'm going to explain two types as, as far as all of us deal with. I'm going to use a word that most of us have never heard and most of us would never use but it is the right word. And if you look this word up, this is going to find you going to find this is exactly what it's talking about. So here's the word. The good kind of stress is called eustress. Now, by eustress, I don't mean Y-O-U. I, I mean E-U, which is the, the hyphen for good. Good stress. You go, what are you talking about? Yeah, there is a good stress that we can all experience. Um, eustress, by definition, physical, mental or emotional tension that is caused by Something positive or psychologically or physically beneficial. Uh, good, good stress comes into your life whenever there's a challenge put before you and you have to decide are you going to rise to it or you're not. 
Are you gonna are you gonna accomplish this? Are you going for it? And you all of a sudden you start feeling things and you're under stress. It's a good stress. Uh, if you'll allow me, I want to just bring you into my life for just a few moments. I want to just tell you about a little bit of the journey I've been on with one particular part of my life. And it's not overly important, but it explains something. I have, I have had something weird happen. And I don't know how many people have had this experience, but I've had this experience. My last three doctors that I have gone to have all retired. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm doing something to them. You know how hard it is when you have a doctor retire and all of a sudden you got to go find another doctor and get up to speed and then they retire and then the next one and then I'm on my fourth doctor. But before I got to my fourth doctor, I started asking around, hey, has anyone got a good doctor? But the question was not, does anyone have a good doctor? All I was looking for was a young doctor. <laughs> this is true. I don't care if he's lousy, is he young? I need somebody who I get to retire before. And so uh, I ask around and somebody goes, hey, I got a young doctor. I also think he's good. And I go, OK, well, I don't care about the good, but the young matter. So what's his name? So I get his name and you need to understand, I've been about a year now without a doctor, which you know, I'll explain in a moment. But uh, I, I finally get this guy's name. And so I make an appointment. But guess what? I'm a new patient, which means bottom of the list. I got to wait like two months. And so finally I get to come in and meet my new young doctor. And I look at him and I go, you look young. <laughs> he took it as an insult, I think, as a compliment. And uh, I go, just tell me you're not gonna retire any time, that's, that's what matters. He goes, I know, I, I'm way too young. I go, good, you're in. And then he goes, well, it brings you in. And I go, well, honestly, I, I feel fine. I feel great. And folks, I do, I feel great. And uh, I go, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm kind of out of medication. I have uh, cholesterol, you know, blood pressure, you know, those are issues. And, but I said, uh, you know, I feel fine, but I probably need to, you know, get that monitor. And uh, he goes, okay. And I go, well, actually there is something that I am genuinely struggling with. And again, I'm just gonna be candid with you. I go, I, as I've gotten older, I'm having a harder and harder time keeping weight off. And uh, you might remember about two years ago or somewhere about there, I, I uh, severed a tendon in my foot and I had to have surgery and I was in a boot and a cast and crutches, remember all this? Well, I just, I, I'm just, I can't keep the weight off and I'm like trying to go back into a routine. And so I just told him that, I go, I go, hey, I, I'm just having a hard time keeping weight off. You could give me any advice. And he was, uh, he, he was very honest. He, he said some things that were, not, were, were I did not want to hear. He, he, this is what he said, and he's what you would have predicted he was going to say. He talked to me about what I eat. Very rude. <laughs> very inappropriate. Talked about how much I eat, how often I eat, when I eat. And he's just like, what is this your, your business in any way? Um, so we went through all of that. And, you know, and there's nothing I can say like, oh, you're kidding. I didn't know that. Uh, so he gave me that lecture uh, appropriately. And then, and then he said something that really, this is, I'm just to be straight with you, okay? It just threw me. He said, um, he goes, uh, but there's a whole nother issue. He goes, how much are you working out? I go, well, I walk. And he goes, that's good, that's good. It's not enough. And I go, well, what do you mean? He, he says, um, you, you're losing, uh, I'm just gonna quote it, you're losing muscle mass. And, and I go, I go to mass. Um, <laughs> no, he goes, muscle mass. Um, you're losing muscle as you get older. It happens to everybody. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I go, what do I do? And then he swore at me. He said, you go to a gym. <laughs> I go, what? He goes, yeah, you go to a gym. And I go, I've, that's not part of my life. And he says, yeah, you, you need to experience something. You need to experience resistance training. I go, what? He goes, yeah, you need to start lifting weights. <laughs> I look at him, I go, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but I am getting ready to retire, so do the math. And I said, you got to be kidding. I, this is what I said to him. I go, I've never lifted weights in my life. And he goes, uh-huh, that's why you're here. <laughs> and uh, I said, I don't know how to lift. I don't have a clue. I, and guys, if you know how to do this, you just got to understand. Never, I've never lifted weights in my entire I don't, all through, all, all of my life, I've never, I don't have a clue. And I told him, I said, I don't have a clue. I don't even know where to begin. He says, go to a gym. I go, well, okay, I'll go to a gym. I go, well, then what? He says, get a trainer. 
I go, get a trainer? He goes, yeah, he'll explain. All. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I'm trying to figure out what to do. I'm talking to some different staff people around here. And I go, hey, uh, I got to find a trainer. Anyone? You got to understand, this is so not a part of my life. I don't ever, I've never done this. And so I asked around and some people said, you know who you ought to ask? You ought to ask, well, this one guy named Scott Chapman, Scott Chapman uh, on our Queen Creek campus. He is the uh, assistant uh, fire chief for the city of Chandler. He is, uh, he works out and he's like, you know, fireman, you know, like. And so uh, you ought to talk to him, see if you know somebody. So I call Scott up and I have a conversation with him. Biggest mistake of my <laughs> life. I go, hey, um, I know this is gonna sound weird, but I, I, I went to this doctor who's really not cool, said I, and I explained it all. And I go, I need to find somebody who will explain all this to me and teach me. And uh, I said, just can you point me anywhere? And he goes, yeah, I'll do it for you. Huge, huge mistake here. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, no, I'd love to train you. I'll do, I'll take you on. So for the last month, literally for the last four weeks at 5.30 in the morning, multiple times a week now, I have show up at a gym and yeah. And I always tell people around me, if the room feels a little bit more crowded, it's because these babies are getting worked and I'm getting, <laughs> yeah, I take a little more room. Anyway, anyway, I digress. And so, so we go to this gym and, and church, I just need to bring it. He's hurting me. He's, and, and you know what? He's doing it on purpose and he's enjoying himself. He gave me a book and he said, you need to journal what you're doing. And I was first resistant, like, I don't want to write all this down. Make me think about it. And he goes, no, write it down. And then I thought about it. I thought, well, this would be good because when he kills me and it goes to court, my <laughs> wife can use this journal as proof what he did to me. And so anyway, every uh, time I go in there, I just know it's going to be painful. It's going to hurt. And uh, he explained it very clearly to me. You got to go through the pain. You got to work through the pain. And, and what you to build muscle mass, you have to stress your muscles. New concept to me. So uh, if you see me walking around sore, I'm stressing my muscles. Get off me. OK, <laughs> um, it's you stress. It's good stress. It's how you grow. Here's what you need to understand. You want to avoid stress. You can kiss growth goodbye. They go together. Stress is necessary for growth. Stress motivates us mentally, stimulates us physically, strengthens us emotionally. Now that's one word, you stress. What's the opposite? It's called distress. Oh, I know that word, distress. Yeah, distress is bad stress. By definition, great pain, anxiety, or sorrow, acute physical or mental suffering. That is bad stress. Bad stress happens when you're facing something that's truly interpreted as a threat or a severe form of suffering. And when there's too much of that, there is a sense of being overwhelmed. And it's not good. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Holmes Rocky stress scale. It's named after two doctors, uh, Dr. Holmes and Dr. Rahi, and they basically put together a scale in which they take the events that all of us tend to experience in our life at some time or another, and they scored them with a value called, they put them in LCUs, life change units. And what happens is at any given time, you can add up your LCUs, and what they've discovered is, is if you go over the number 300, you're going to, you're, you're on the verge of some form of illness, whether it's a physical or a mental. So LCUs become the criteria in which you add up. Now, there's a long list. I'm not, I don't, I'm not gonna choose. You can look this up, okay? Um, and just look up stress scale and you'll see, you'll, this what will pop up. Let me give you an example though of some of the things that are on the list to give you an idea. Okay, <clears throat> so if you experience the death of a spouse, that's 100. That's the big one, okay, 100. If you go through a divorce, that's 73. The marital separation is 65. If you have any time of jail term, uh, 63. Uh, if you uh, get married, 50. <laughs> Points against you, okay, just so you know. Uh, you get pregnant, 40. The death of a close friend is 37. Trouble with in-laws, 29. Change in residence, you move, 
20. Uh, Changing your sleep habits, 16. Hey, you're going to go on vacation. It's Christmas. 13 points against you, just so you know. Getting a ticket, uh, 11. Now, if you look at the entire thing, what you discover is all kinds of things in our lives are stress inducing. It's very, very common. All right. But what they did is, again, they figured out. Now, listen carefully. If you add up at any given time and you're over 300, you're in the red light. You're in you're over the limit and you're in danger. Now, I want to tell you something. I want you to hold this in your memory for just a few moments. People have studied the life of Mary and Joseph, the earthly parents of Jesus. And they've run the numbers on them and their life. I don't have time to break all that down right now, but they came up with a score of 435. 435. And you know, it's not on the list that you can measure. What happens when you're a young Jewish woman in a Jewish culture at the time of, you know, uh, know, 2000 years ago and uh, and, and you have your betrothed and all of a sudden you come up pregnant and your best explanation is, I don't really know, man, it was the Holy Spirit. How do you score that one? on the scale. That's not in the 435. That's on top of it. Why am I telling you this? I, I, when I land this thing in just a moment, I'm going to explain something. Jesus understands your stress. He was born into a family that had a lot of it and they were wonderful people. Stress is not the enemy. Too much stress becomes the problem. Now, let's talk about too much stress. We're going to call this burnout. Burnout. Uh, burnout is when you're mentally, physically or exhausted for a prolonged period of time. It's more than just being tired. It's feeling drained. It's feeling overwhelmed. It's disconnected to what used to motivate you. You lose energy focus and sometimes you lose your passion for anything. If stress is too much, burnout is just too little. I just got nothing left. It's all this. It's all been. I mean, the, the sponge is just nothing. It erodes your optimism, your energy, your effectiveness. Let me, let me show you an example. Now we're going to jump in to Exodus chapter 18. I want to talk to you about the life of Moses. Now, Moses is arguably, I mean, without question, one of the biggest characters in the Bible, just so we all have a context. I want to just explain to you a couple of things about his life. Uh, Moses... Um, and, and again, this is a short list. There's so much more. I just can't take the time. Let me just explain to you a little bit about Moses. So Moses, um, at 80 years old, has an encounter with God who's in a bush that's burning, but is not being burnt up. God is speaking to him from a bush that's on fire. And then God says, take your shoes off because the ground you're standing on is holy. Okay, just for the record, if this ever were to happen to me, high up on the stress scale. Can I get anyone who would agree? That would stress me out, right? God's in a bush talking to me. And you know what he said to him? I need you to go back down to Egypt and I need to get my people out of Egypt. They're in captivity. For hundreds of years, they've been held captive as slaves. I need you to go get them out. Um, to do that, you have to go have a face-to-face encounter with the most powerful man in the world, the Pharaoh of Egypt. Yeah, you have to, you have to get in his face and you have to threaten him. And, uh, you, you can do that. Uh, I'm going to give you some miracles. You can pull that thing off again, if you're familiar with that story. And so he goes down there. He has this confrontation. He gets them out. Pharaoh pursues them, the Red Sea, all that kind of stuff. And then they get on the other side. We ought to be happy. We're free. And yet all they can do is gripe and complain. And they just do that. They're miserable. And all they wish, I wish we were back where we came from. I wish we were back in the land of Egypt where we have food and homes and everything which they were crying out in misery when they were down there. So he's got to lead them around. He's got to take them on what should be an 11 day hike into the promised land. Except God goes, no, these people are not ready. So they wander around the the desert. By the way, for 40 years, they wandered around, just so you know. And uh, then one day Moses goes on top of a mountain. You've probably heard of Mount Sinai. And while he's up there, God meets with him and says, hey, I want to give you some absolutes to give the people. Uh, We'll call them the Ten Commandments. And you go down and teach them these Ten Commandments. These are ten non-negotiables. And so uh, Moses gets the Ten Commandments. He goes down and he gets to explain that these are the things that God will not tolerate. And uh, you can imagine how that went over. Because um, 
what these people were really prone to do was whine and complain and rebel. So he's got to lead this rebellious people uh, to honor God, who is like, and they, they just they have a remember the golden calf, you know, this rebellion against God. And he's got to take care of all of that. That would be incredibly stressful. Um, one of the things he was called to do was settle disputes when people would have an argument. He was the final voice. He was the Supreme Court justice of the only person on the bench. He would decide. He was married to a woman named Zipporah. Read about it. Stressful. He had uh, siblings, uh, Aaron and Miriam. Very difficult relationships with them. Read about it. He, he at the end, after doing all of this, he, he got really frustrated with the people and he struck a rock. And the, the, God said, that little fit of rage is going to keep you out of the promised land. He never got to take the people into the promised land. It was Joshua, his successor. I just want to say, I fully understand his fit of rage. I get it. But God said, that's not what I asked you to do. So what well, the point I'm trying to make is, it, it, have you, it, is that enough stress? Is that enough for any human? Enough? It'd be more than enough for me. Now, I want to take you to Exodus chapter 18. I want to show you something that happened that I just think says a lot. In Exodus 18, verses 13 down to 26. I, I, I always encourage you, I will do it again. Bring a Bible. I want you familiar with the Bible. It's your friend. You don't need to fear it. But you've got to become familiar with it for it to be friendly. And so bring a Bible. Exodus is the second book of the Bible. Chapter 18. We're going to read of something that happened one day in the life of Moses. Here we go. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. Okay, whoa, whoa. You think you have long days? From morning till evening, day in and day out, week in and week out, year in and year out, from morning till evening. He had to sit and listen to all these arguments between the Israelite people. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you're doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses answered him, because the people come to me and they seek God's will. Now, whenever they have a dispute, it's brought to me and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and laws. It's my job. And Moses' father-in-law replied, what you're doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. You're all going to burn out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me and I will give you some advice. And may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them the decrees and laws and show them the way to live and the duties they are to perform. But so that capable men from all the people who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them, it gives you an idea of the scope, all right? Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this, and, and so God commands, you will be able to stand the strain. Let me paraphrase. You can stand the stress. And all these people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. That's the first time that has ever happened on the planet. And it was recorded in the Bible where a man listened to his father-in-law and said, and did all he said, just make a note in your Bible. He chose capable men from all of Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses but the simple ones, they decided themselves. Well, that makes sense. Moses, why do you think you got to do all this? Who made you judge? Hmm. Moses, why do you feel like everybody, you have to be there for everybody? Let me translate in more recent vernacular that we've used. Moses, why have you no boundaries? Why have you no boundaries in your life? What, what makes you feel like you can do this? What makes you feel like you should do this? What makes you think God wants you to do this? And Moses' father-in-law says, and you're going to kill yourself. You're going to kill everybody around you. Um, remember I told you they whined and they complained and Moses had to put up with it? 
a, a number of years ago, and I don't, really don't remember, it was a decade or 15 years ago or something, I don't know. Um, there is a, I have a couple of men in my life that have mentored me through the years in ministry and uh, significant men in my life. And one of them, a number of years ago, I was meeting with uh, in another state and I went there to visit with him and I was talking to him and he, how's it going? And I, how's it going? I said, oh, I said, I, I'm, I'm, I just feel overwhelmed. He said, well, tell me about it. I said, oh, I just, I feel like there's so much is required. And I, and I find, I just how he said, it. I go, I feel like I'm, I find myself angry that I have to do what my schedule demands I do. I just find myself just getting like short fuse, like it's too much. And um, I was just whining and, and, and griping. That's what I was doing. And I thought I had a sympathetic ear. And then he looks at me and he goes, so um, who's in charge at your church? I go, what? He goes, who's in charge at your church? And I go, well, what do you mean? Who's the senior pastor in your church? And I go, well, he's an idiot. I go, I am. And he goes, oh, so you feel like you should drive your staff that hard? I'm just telling you, man, he slapped me hard. He goes, you're a big boy. You set your own schedule. When it's too much, you're to blame. I got to tell you this. Now, let me get out of that story. This is a fantastic church. And I'm, I'm biased. Yes, I've been here a long, long time. This church does not destroy families that work here. I have nothing to complain about. You know who's doing that? I was doing that. I was doing that to myself. And what he slapped me around and woke me up to is, why don't you set some boundaries? Why don't you do what you need your people to do? Why don't you be a man and, and draw some lines around your time and quit blaming the church? It changed my life, it just changed my life. So let me get real personal with you. I know there's stress in your life. Is it too much? How much did you invite in because you refused to say no? You could have said no. And then you're mad and you're angry and you're frustrated because you got to do something. How much of, where's the boundaries? This is, Mo, Moses created this mess. And his father-in-law woke him up to it. Listen to me, church. I'm not your father-in-law. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a counselor. You know what I am? I am a pastor who cares about people and the welfare of their life. That's what I've given my life to do. So I want to close this message with some pastoral words to you. Th th these are things I do know. I want to give you four things to walk out of here to think about wherever you are. And so let me, um, let me fire these off at you and we'll be done. Number one of four things I want to tell you. Number one, understand that God loves you and he cares about your struggles. Understand that he loves you. I've said this so many times, I, I don't know how to say it any better. God is for you. He is on your side. He is, he's, he wanted you in his family. He's, he's not against you. God, God is your friend. He's your father, his family. He wants nothing but the best for you. First Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Isaiah 41, 10, so do not fear, God says, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I'm your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So first thing I need you to understand is God is there for you, which takes me to the second one. Surrender your stresses to God. What does that mean? It means quit hanging on to everything. Quit being like, I got, it's got to be me, like Moses. I got, they bring him to me. And what Jethro showed him is there's so many other people that are capable to do what you think only you can do. Why don't you give your stressors to God and go, God, help me to find balance here. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I'm going to say a saying that it's going to sound so churchy. It's going to sound so cliche-ish. And I get it. And I'm going, to, I'm going to say it. And then I want to just make a point. There's an old saying that goes like this. If you're going to pray about it, don't worry about it. If you're going to worry about it, don't bother to pray about it. What does that mean? It means at the end of the day, in your mind, in the battle for your mind, either you're going to see yourself in control of the problem or you're going to see God as control. 
That's what that's driving at. If you're gonna take control, all you got to solve the problem is your own resources. If you let God take control of the problem, you got his resources. So if you're gonna pray about it, just give it to God. And again, I'm not trying to sound trite. I know it's just pray more. But if you're truly praying and giving it to God, let God have it. And then you, you take a nap, he's got it. He'll take the watch. But if you're not gonna give it to him, just prepare, you're gonna be stressed out. It's gonna overwhelm you. But you can't pray and worry. Pick one. I think it's incredible wisdom. Here's a third one. Establish the margin that allows you to rest. Rest is huge in the issues of mental health. Um, if you're simply exhausted all the time, you are redlining your engine. And if you don't understand what redlining, too many RPMs. You, so on your car, on that tachometer, there's that red section that comes after the eight or wherever. And if you run that engine that hard into that red zone, something will break. It's just telling you, you can, you can get there, you can do it, but you can't do it for long. If you're as gossiped all the time, stress out all the time, you're redlining. And I wanna say something, I hope this is gonna make sense to you. Too many people let their faith stress them out. What am I talking about? Too many people think that God's like this judge watching every screw up you make and counting points against you. Like the scale, like, oh, you think you're going to heaven on what you did, who you are? If your understanding of God doesn't fill you with hope, fill you with life, replenish the emptiness inside you, you don't understand who God is because he's for you. So many of us are so afraid that he's counting every screw up and I goofed up again and it's so stressful. What makes you think God is keeping score on your screw ups? He's for you. So if your faith isn't like bringing life to your, you're doing something wrong. The engine light came on. This is not healthy. Jesus said these words, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Sound like your God? That was Jesus. That's why God established a, a Sabbath rest. God could have gone on and on and on, but he said enough, six days, enough. And he set an example for us by saying the seventh day, we just got to get our breath. You ignore that at your own peril. And the fourth one, and this will be the last. Just trust that God's in control, always. When you give something to God and you let him have it because you decided, I'm not going to worry, I'm not going to pray and then worry. I'm going to give it to him. Just trust him. He, you go take a nap. He's got it. He'll stay up all night taking care of your issue, you, you go get some rest. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He'll make your path straight. Trust God. Give it to God and relax. Trust him. Um, when I was, uh, first became a believer, I was a high school senior. And um, one of my friends had in his room a poster that was taken from the Simon and Garfunkel song, Bridge Over Troubled Water waters or whatever. And um, this, it was kind of a psychedelic 70s kind of a thing, but it said, uh, God, a bridge over troubled water. And it showed a storm and a bridge, like a stone bridge. And, and the idea was that when you walk with God, you get to walk over the bridge, over the storm, over the waves. And I thought that was the coolest thing. I thought, yeah, I, I just, be, just began my journey with God. And this is gonna be so awesome because I, I'm never gonna, I'm not going to face the storms I would have faced without him. <laughs> As years have gone by, I've thought about that poster. Told me that's the stupidest thing ever. Do not buy that poster if you ever see it. All right. God isn't a bridge over. You know what God is? God is a boat to get in that will protect you in the waves of the storm. But you're going to feel the waves. You're going to feel the storm. God's giving you a place of support. He's literally going, just get in here. And uh, yeah, we're going to get buffeted. It's going to, it can be brutal. It can be Milton, you know, you're not Lieutenant Dan, you know, just, just get ready. Um, the storms are going to come. That, that was huge. You know why that's huge? 
Because God knows that if he doesn't let you feel stress, you'll never grow. You'll never become anything more than you now are. So just so you know, um, God didn't keep Noah from the flood. He didn't keep Abraham and Sarah from aging. He didn't keep Joseph from prison. He didn't keep David from squaring off with Goliath. He didn't keep Elijah from continuing with the prophets of Baal. He didn't keep Daniel out of the lions. He didn't keep Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of the fiery furnace. He didn't keep Jonah out of a fish. He didn't keep Paul from jail. He didn't keep Jesus from the cross. You could almost make the case that if God's for you, he's going to let you experience your stress, build muscle mass in your faith. It's this image that I, I, I know we've all seen, but I just want to put this image in your mind. That's the tree on the, the hill where the wind just beats the thing to death. But against all the adversity, it stands strong. Here's another image, the same sort of a thing. We've all seen this. Go, how in the world did this tree grow into this rock? So I want to close by reminding you there's no growth without struggle. And then I want to take you to the last day of freedom for Jesus. I want you to go with me into the Garden of Gethsemane. It's at the end of Jesus' life. He goes into this garden at night. Uh, he goes in there to pray. He brings his apostles. He takes three of them, Peter, James, and John. He goes further into the garden. He says, stay here and pray while I go further in. He goes further in, and he has a conversation with his father. You know what his conversation was? God, is there any other way? Is there any other way? Can I save mankind without having to go through the crucifixion? It was so intense a struggle. It was so stressful that he sweat drops of blood. I have never, and my guess is you have never been so stressed out that you sweat drops of blood. But the next day, I mean, literally through the trials and, you know, through the journey, they take him, Jesus, and they nail him to a tree on a hill. Pierce his hands, pierce his feet, pierce his side. They just, never happened to me. You, you see, Jesus sweat drops of blood because he was going to face a Roman crucifixion, which at the time was the most barbaric, tortuous form of death humanity could conceive of. How can we make you suffer long enough to set an example for anyone who wants to be like you to not want to choose to follow you? Why am I telling you this? Jesus was born into a very stressful family, lived a stressful life, died a stressful death. He gets your stress. Whatever God's allowing in your life, he's doing it to make you better. Until that point that he's going, give this one to me, and you're refusing. You stress is good, distress is bad. I'm going to ask for the next few moments that you would, this, I'm, I'm going to pray here, and then we'll do this. When you walked in, you were given the, the cup and the loaf. The loaf represents the body of Christ. The cup represents the blood. This was the culmination of Jesus' stress. And it was done for you on your behalf to set you free. You don't have to carry it now. You, you, you have this done for you. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna pray here in just a moment and then I'm gonna ask for about two minutes of just, two minutes of no one talking at you. Two minutes where you can just give to God. Two things I'm gonna ask you to give to God. One, give him thanks for the you stress in your life, the good stress that's making you better, stretching you, growing muscle mass, and then give him your distress. Oh God, this one's overwhelming me. I know that if I, if I cried out to my, 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 my trainer, he would back off. He didn't want to hurt me. I know that. God doesn't want to hurt you. He's for you. When it's too much, talk to your father. God, it's too much. So I'll stop talking and let you just talk to your father. He gets you, he gets stressed. Let me pray. Father, hear our prayers. Meet us where we are. Listen to our voices. And I thank you for who you are and what you've done. 
for all the you stress you allow and all the distress you're trying your hardest to get us to give to you. God, give us wisdom in this moment, I pray. Amen.